right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. Happy Thursday, everybody. Uh, today is National Apple Pie Day and National Fruit Cocktail Day. This is a huge event with an outstanding audience here. We have people from all the continents joining us today. This is, this is incredible and shows how important this topic is for everybody in the world. The regulation is surely for everybody, not just for the US-based firms. Uh, so a few housekeeping items before we start. Amy, if you could show the housekeeping slides, please. Uh, please make sure you do mute your lines. Um, and the recording will be shared after the session along with the deck um, uh, that we'll present today. Uh, Q&A session will be done at the very end. Please use the Zoom Q&A function to submit your question and we'll be addressing at the very end of the session. If uh, more time is needed to address further questions, we will be happy to address those via email uh, as needed after the webinar. Next slide, please. So these are panelists for today. Uh, Mr. Alan Morley from uh, IDCDO Inc. He's based out of New Jersey. Uh, me and Alan, we have worked together for many, many years, uh, back to my uh, days at Oracle Financial Services. Uh, is obviously myself, I am a director at the SNA practice at Huron Consulting Group. I am based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And we have our special guest here, Mr. John Tabon. He is a special agent, agent in charge for the Homeland Security Investigations. He's based out of the beautiful state of Hawaii. You can definitely tell from his awesome tropical shirt. John and I, John, I think we are all jealous of where you you, you're based at, right? So beautiful Hawaii. It's certainly much better than Charlotte and New Jersey, right? No offense to anybody that lives in these areas. <laughs> well, I grew up in New York City, so I know all about New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Next slide, Amy, please. So a little bit about the Huron. Um, Kira has been in business since 2002, and we are headquartered in the windy city of Chicago. Uh, we are publicly traded in NASDAQ under the Huron sticker, H-U-R-N. Uh, we bring a depth of expertise in strategy, technology, operations, advisory, and analytics to drive lasting and measurable results in the financial services, energy utilities, healthcare, higher education, life sciences, and other commercial industries. Uh, in 2020 alone, we have served more than 1,700 businesses in several different industries across the globe. Uh, we have, although we are headquartered in Chicago, we have locations also in Europe, in uh, India, where we have our most of the off offshore resources. Uh, Amy, can you please put in the next slide? So we're just going to start with the State of the Union. Uh, as everybody knows, the ML Act is the largest update uh, in the regulation in the past 20 years since the release of the US Patriot Act. A lot of regulatory changes will take place as governments seek to respond to new financial technologies, uh, such as example of virtual assets or crypto, uh, uh, NFTs and such. And the, promote, the, the act is also trying to promote the use of the technology to tackle financial crime, with, uh, which raises regulatory expectations and also leads to a much stronger enforcement. Uh, there is the COVID-19 linked crime, uh, such as the uh, frauds, impersonations, use of shell companies and fake businesses to explore CARES Act benefits. Uh, for example, taking out loans, PPP loans uh, for businesses that are probably not even existed or they are not even eligible for that. There's a lot of those crimes going on around me now, currently. Uh, that's just a few of the threats out there. All that requires the firms to engage in cross-industry dialogue and, and seize opportunities to innovate as an industry. industry. And the industry change, uh, trends are changing very quickly and by the creation of innovative solutions, uh, especially through a public-private collaboration, just like we're doing right now here in this webinar, it's some of the trends that we should be looking out for. Uh, obviously, the raise, of, the raise of cryptocurrency trading uh, will also bring new risks and a different view on how to investigate those transactions that are based on the blockchain. A lot of people use the cryptocurrency thinking that they are 
hiding themselves somewhere. Uh, but nobody really knows or maybe forgets that the blockchain itself never forgets. So that's going to just bring a whole new level of investigation that can be done. Uh, and potential crimes can be tracked from years. Uh, and you can link those transactions to a person that you're investigating. Because again, the blockchain never forgets. So once the transaction the blockchain, the transaction is in the blockchain, cannot be modified. So the firms need to ensure that they have robust, uh, flexible, and integrated screening and monitoring systems in place to navigate the complexities of these different types of financial crimes. I think everyone watching Mr. Elon Musk yesterday tweeting about that uh, Tesla is not using Bitcoin because it uses a lot of energy and that immediately caused a panic in the crypto market. So uh, because it's not fully regulated yet, uh, you know, those type of things can happen. So it's another risk. And Alan, so how about the de novo banks and uh, payment processors? Uh, what do you see training in that industry right now? Well, first of all, Eduardo, I see a lot of uh, activity and <clears throat> working and talking with a number of these institutions over the last year. There's been an acceleration uh, of two factors. One, COVID has helped with uh, a lot of people realizing that remote banking in terms of a service for people is very much now um, a reality. It's just accelerated the number of entrants into the game. However, behind that, we're now beginning to see finally uh, better clarification as to what is a de novo or a neo bank. And lately we've seen Chime being reprimanded for using the term bank, etc., uh, in their marketing. And they've been accused of misleading the public because Chime are not a bank. And so the Californian regulator has slapped their wrist. And that's going to have an impact on a number of others. So what we're seeing is a, an uptick in terms of moving from what we call a payment enabler or a slick digital device that gets people an account, a deposit account at another bank and gets them a digital debit card through to these institutions moving across and focusing on becoming chartered banks, either at the state level or we see it at the national level with the likes of Varo and their OCC charter. There are others coming along in the pipeline as well. So there's definitely been a change in that regard. Uh, what needs to, what remains to be seen is how well these institutions embrace the BSA and the AMLA 2020 um, rules because they are not mature established organizations and there is a lot that needs to be done before they are properly up running and risk practiced, I think is the best way of putting it. Right. And I think a lot of things happening in the OCC as well, right, to approve those new institutions, right? Uh, uh, OCC might be uh, getting a little bit more tight on how they're going to evaluate those institutions there for their readiness to get yes, well, a permanent charter, correct? Yeah. So you've got an interesting uh, recent period of time. You had Brian Brooks at the OCC, who is very much future thinking and looking to embrace anything uh, to do with blockchain and crypto, et cetera. And you can see that happen. And he was also, I think, instrumental in helping push along the VARO application and process. Now that's all changed, but we're still seeing other things take shape. So there are, there are more institutions in the pipeline for either pre-charter or full uh, charter. And this is a very interesting space. But what where I'm also finding interesting is, is how the regular and mainstream banks are adopting the same technologies and looking at how they can come to market utilizing the same kinds of things. But it all centers on how well they capture, manage and maintain their risks, customer data and do their surveillance and monitoring, the execution of the controls. Right. OK, sounds good. So let's just dive in for our agenda. Uh, Amy, if you can go to the next slide, please. So the first one is, the first time in the agenda is about beneficial ownership. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the risk-based AML uh, counter-terrorist uh, counter financing. And then later on the impact to SARS and CTRs. So let's just talk about the beneficial ownership. Uh, so Alan, um, what, uh, 
this topic is always a struggle for the institutions, especially I work with. Um, it's always a problem to determine, you know, what is the data that needs to be used and what should be the list of input sources, uh, et cetera. Um, making the decision if that information is available or if the information they have is enough that is available, right? So what do you, what do you see that uh, should be the, the next court of action here for institutions in terms of using the data to how to really go do that investigation on the beneficial ownerships? Well, I want to separate that into two parts and it should actually tie in uh, hopefully sort of some things that John, you and I have been talking about uh, as we go forward. When we're looking at beneficial owners there are two points where we, we look at it one is when somebody's opening up an account and we're looking at who are the beneficial owners of that account and if it's a um, non-individual entity it's a corporation we're looking at all the way through to identifying those people that control the financial assets and um, where that money goes and how how it operates and that can be a russian doll of many times etc now there are some frustrations with the new act that um a number of people have already commented on the wording is not necessarily crystal clear but i don't think it necessarily impacts banks reality that they have a certain amount of due diligence to do and what comes down to is how far do they have to get um, everybody or is it simply that they need to know enough so that they understand where control lies in a majority and that comes down to the risk-based policy of each institution that does that and that's defined in the risk assessment and the, um, the risk um, coverage assessment that the bank must execute on an annualized basis certainly if you're um, New York Department of Financial Services regulated you're doing that every year the other area is on the wire international payments and you have third parties and if that third party is an institution and you have far less information so there's a different standard to meet in terms of what you can actually determine about that institution. And where it all comes to a head is what ultimately feeds into a SAR and then ultimately ends up on John's desk. Correct me if I'm wrong, John. No, absolutely. And, and I think when, you, when you're talking about beneficial ownership, this, the one thing to remember is whatever comes out of FinCEN, whatever the government puts out, do not think that as the gold standard. What the government puts out is the no frills brand. That's the bottom, not the ceiling, right? That's the floor, not the ceiling. It's the minimum that you must do. So if Vincent, for instance, says, hey, you need to get down to, you know, 25, 10, 15%, that's the minimum that you have to do. It does not keep you as, a, as an industry from going further and and that you know and it goes back to what alan says it just really has to do with your specific appetite for uh for risk if you want to go ahead and um you know roll the dice then that's fine but understand that if you end up taking on all of that risk then you know with all of that risk can um the amount of, of liability that you're going to be bringing on to you know to your your institution is going to grow exponentially and with the, the, the other thing that, that it's important in terms of um, the, you know, what's going on with beneficial ownership and what's happening overseas is that the gap between what law enforcement knows has access to um, in regards to information being overseas is quickly shrinking. So if you've been in this industry for, you know, 20 years, I, you know, I can assure you, we have a lot of, you know, there is more access, there's more connectivity, there's more information exchange, there are more treaties in place for law enforcement to connect those dots today than they were 20 years ago. And there will be, um, it'll be, um, there will be more information exchange in the future, you know, as we go on. Um, because one of the biggest challenges that we had was having the information available overseas, right? A lot of information here was electronic. A lot of information overseas was not. Well, that technology gap has now been overcome. So there is a lot, there are a lot more resources, both for financial institutions as well as law enforcement to actually get access to that information um, that can help you verify that, benef that beneficial ownership to whatever percentage you want. Yeah. 
uh, it, it's interesting because we're also seeing an uptick in OFAC realization as OFAC also has access now to the same data that banks have access to. And this explosion of corporate data and corporate um, ownership in other regions and other centers and this, you know, the, the new capabilities that are coming out, even non-financial institutions are realizing that they have to do a much better job in analyzing the risk of who they are doing business with, not just who their customers are, but who their suppliers are and the relationships that their employees have with those communities. Because gradually they too are learning that the bank knows a lot more about their business and who they're doing business with than at times they do. And so you can see a confluence of what's happening. And I think the, the attempt by the act to bring things together and standardize, it certainly puts everybody on notice that we are aware that the capabilities are out there. You've got to make sure that you are using those capabilities effectively, productively, and in line with your risk policies and tolerances. And, and if I can add one more thing, there, there's a new violation that is created by the act that act, uh, that I think is, is directly related to beneficial ownership. And from speaking to financial institutions, it's one of the, the, the biggest complaints from financial institutions, or it has been, which is, look, I ask for information from the client, but I don't know if they're telling me the truth. I don't know if that information is false. I have no way of knowing. Well, the act actually now creates a new, a new crime which uh, makes it illegal to deceive financial institutions. So that helps us, you know, bring all of that um, together. And 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 again, it 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 does something which which I think is is the overarching, um, the overarching message of this act, which is that the financial institution that the financial institutions and law enforcement need to team up. They you know there has to be that relationship we need to take this just hey just give me information and i'll figure out what to do with it and go from that to a a collaborative model where you not only do you hand me the information but together we examine the information and we figure out what the next step is for right. both for law enforcement in order to enforce the law and for the financial industry in order to lower their their risk right right and uh, John, and uh, I think the institutions they need to be prepared for this, right? In terms of uh, leveraging the technology, right? And uh, uh, a lot of the things that the act is um, is suggesting is the modernization, right, of the applications that they use. So, uh, for example, uh, in, especially in international wire, as you mentioned, right, we need to scan the international wire for all the information that is on the international wire and figure out exactly what is an institutional name there, what is exactly an address there. So uh, using that, a, a human person just reading those texts, it's, it's fairly impossible to determine what it is, an address, what is the name, and so on, right? And that's, that's why, you know, we, especially from our standpoint here, here on, we have been suggesting and working with clients to implement uh, the next generation AML tools in incorporating data science as well to perform entity resolution. And we're going to, you know, plug in different data sets, uh, external data sets, and even internal data sets. And we can compare uh, all the scrabble data that is, you know, all over the place and determining what exactly, helping the client to determine exactly what that information, what it resolves to, right? And then from there, you can use leverage graph databases and create connections between related parties that before you didn't even know that those connections existed, right? And I think that helps also law enforcement because when uh, the banks are filing the SARS, right, and sending information over to you guys, then they have all the information they have. They are compiling all the information in one step and sending it over to you. And then it helps you guys to determine, it makes your job easier as an investigator, right? To conclude what is, uh, what is really the related parties here on this suspicious transaction. Was that yeah. John? Yes, to John. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> look, in, and I think part of the, the what this act does in terms of the beneficial ownership is it, it allows us to cut down a lot of time, a lot of the time that we are spending trying to figure out, you know, who is behind all of these companies. Once we know who is behind the companies, then we can begin 
what we really want to do, which is the process of verifying whether or not there is any illegal activity involved with the transactions associated with these companies. Um, and so in, in that respect, yes. And, and I can tell you that right now, the, there is a, a little bit of an arms race between private industry and the government to figure out how, especially, and the government is, you know, it's on the losing end because, you know, because of, of the pay scale. But we're trying to figure out how we can bring on more data scientists. And I can tell you that within Homeland Security investigations, we have data scientists now. You know, that is where we are going with our, um, um, you know, investigative focus, because we realize the power. Look, we have access to vast amounts of data. And if we can cut down the time that it takes us to sift through that data so that we can come up with with more verifiable information, then we can do what, what we what we really, really like to do, which is to go out, investigate and, and, and see whether or not a crime has been committed. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is all great information, John. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, so let's just uh, go to the next topic, which is the risk-based uh, AML. So a lot on that too, right? And a lot that involves obviously data, right? And, and modeling and, and other technology things, right? So Alan, uh, so let's just talk a little bit about the AML CFT. So what do you what do you see changing on that part? So what do you think that the risk appetite changes or the policy and procedures is going to be uh, changing in banks for, around that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I think we, we have to remember that the U.S. has two banking um, universes. There's the federal and then there's the 50 states, et cetera. And the leading a uh, standard very much from my experience and watching how other institutions have reacted to it is the New York Department of Financial Services and in particular their requirement for Rule 504 to certify on the AML and sanction screening systems. What we see now with the AML Act of 2020 is um, an alignment, I believe, coming to that. And you can already see in some of the publications that the um, regulators have come out with such as, and just calling it up now, we've recently had in April, the um, interagency statement on model risk management for bank systems, supporting Bank Secrecy Act and anti-money laundering compliance. And in it, it starts to tell everybody, certainly at a national level, what um, the requirements need to start with. And it starts with the risk assessment. So while New York has been pushing that for some time, and if you're audited by the OCC, that's something that you were used to, it, you can see that the act is moving to that direction, that every institution needs to start with their proper AML risk assessment. They need to call out their AML priorities, and then they need to be able to then structure their response and their program and their controls to meet the letter of the law. And that's how they'll be examined. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but it comes down to the sensible application of the model risk or the, the risk appetites and um, risk approaches that the bank is willing to accept, defining those, codifying them, integrating it into your policies and procedures, and then you've got to see it in action. And that feeds all the way down into the data, feeds into the tuning, etc. All of that needs to be done. So that really is targeted at those institutions that haven't caught up to that standard yet. So everybody gets a lift. Now we understand we've all got to do the same thing. And that will improve the integrity of the data that makes its way into the SAR universe that ends up in John's lap. Right. And, and you know, in, in terms of the, the, you know, the risk assessment, um, it, it's important for, for the banks to, for financial institutions to be proactive and document what they do to lower that risk or to address that risk. Because again, the government cannot tell you not to onboard a client. That is 100% on the institution. However, you know, you're know you responsible for whatever that client does while he's in your house, right? Whatever damage they do, you're going to, to be responsible for. So it's a matter yeah. of how are you, are you going to, you know, to assign you know, a babysitter of sorts because you really want to keep that client or are you going to say, look, you know what, it's not worth it. Um, but, you know, that portion of it is, is extremely important in terms of being able to uh, document what you have done. You know, that you took every level of care to manage that client at their risk. 
Um, and that's how you're going to, you know, from the, from the criminal side, I can tell you, that's how you're going to be able to make the case that the, my criminal liability is lessened by these actions that I took. Um, as long as the actions that you took were, you know, were um, um, really geared towards making sure that, that that person did no harm. But if the actions were taken just so you can keep that person on board, then that's not going to be um, the proper view of how you, you know, you should be managing, you should be managing risks for these clients. Right. And uh, the other thing is, John, you know, with all these tightening regulations now, so the banks really don't really have to worry that this client is going to be doing business at the bank at the corner, right? Because they're going to have to be subject to the same strict regulations that they, they are doing, right? So it's not necessarily just about keeping the client or just because you're afraid they're going to be banking somewhere else, but they're not going to be able to bank somewhere else if they continue doing the same, you know, type of like, criminal activities, right? Uh, and, and that's and that's where, you know, the provisions, you know, in this act that, uh, you know, that allow for the the... Um, the exchange of, of, of BSA data and, and, and um, among different branches across different yeah. different countries helps because I think it, it begins again. You know, I, I think what, what the act really is trying to do is is trying to um, close those communication gaps that existed um, and that you know to to some extent still exists. But to say, look, the, the, the likelihood that somebody is going to be able to, as you know, as uh, as Edward was, you said. You know, just go across the street and be able to open up open up a bank account. The idea is that through the processes that already exist, as well as some of the additional um, authorities that are vested in this act, that that client, as soon as they walk across the street, that new financial institution would be like, "Oh yeah, no, I already got a call about you from the guys across the street, <laughs> and yeah, we we don't want any part of you." <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, so building on, on that, Eduardo, you, you also have a situation where you, you understand the processes that you put in place. If you look at uh, the rise in the new electronic banking operations that are coming in, people can open up, but they don't have to cross the street anymore. I can download five apps and apply to five banks in a matter right. of minutes and see, see what I get open and so on. And this now creates another problem. So We've got to make sure that the law is set in a way that these new entrants to the game understand their responsibility to maintaining proper risk management programs. Now, I've been building out on stuff I've been doing, say, with iPaid, is how accurately and efficaciously do we capture information from a prospective customer? How well do we verify and validate that person? And because we've moved it into um, onboarding businesses, how do we identify the beneficial owner and how do we capture that, et cetera? And how can we take that data that we get, images, documents, other forms of biometric information, and run it through various forms of uh, CDD and the whole customer uh, identification process to derive a result that we are actually happy with? Because for those of you who've had the, the thrill and the pleasure of taking a walk down the dark side of the web, You'll see that PayPal are still the number one institution if you want to commit fraud and rob accounts. You'll still see Western Union are there. And now you're seeing the uptick of all of these other neobanks because synthetic ID creation is something that is a challenge to them. And you're also seeing that uh, a lot of these accounts are opening up and moving money in ways in which is, is a challenge to, to manage. So the law is important, it updates now because the industry is accelerating um, and the risks are growing. When you wait till 5G kicks in, um, that will change things even further. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And another thing just to, to mention is that, you know, one of the, uh, one of the things that the Act is, is calling out is that the institutions should use a model risk management, right, uh, to uh, do the transactional monitoring and, and quantifying the risk on those, right? But I guess, you know, at this point, it is just a recommendation. There is really no guidance, just like there is for uh, ALM risk, for example, right? For well, asset liability management. Th there, and, is, there is better guidance since April. And that, that's encouraging. 
And this is where you ultimately see from a risk-based approach, you see the right kind of tools can be brought in. They better understood relative to the risk. So if you look at what the kinds of things that Huron does and that I've been working with you on, and you're looking at advanced analytics behind what your customer, who your customer is and who they associate with, do business with, et cetera, yeah. all these other, other forms of hidden links, the analysis that you have available to you is as impactful as all of this extra data that we were talking about earlier being available to everybody. So right. banks have to up their game because everybody knows the capability is out there and that's where they need assistance. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Okay, yeah, that's uh, certainly a topic for possibly another webinar that we can do together here throughout the year, right? Um, so Amy, so let's go with the first polling question that uh, was, um, we, unfortunately, we, we skipped on the first uh, uh, the first topic. So, uh, where do you think that you are on your current AML KOC operations? Uh, that what is the impact that you think the AML X of twenty twenty will be impacting on your AML KOC operations? So, it's policy procedures, investigations, the customer onboarding and data capture, or surveillance technology. It's a multiple choice question. Just give another minute or so for people to reply. All right. Do you have uh, an answer? The answers Maybe? are still coming in, Eduardo. I'm going to let it run for just another five. Okay. Yeah. Let's just give it another 30 seconds. the result okay so let's see yeah so <laughs> this is exactly what we thought it would be so it's definitely around the policy procedures and the customer onboarding data capture right that's the the biggest impact that uh, we we have been seeing actually already in the customers we've been working with so uh that definitely kind of validates what we we're thinking earlier <laughs> yeah and it's, it's it echoes what i'm saying yeah exactly Okay, so let's just uh, move on into the next topic and uh, let's talk about the impact of the SARS and CTRs. So, Alan, what do you think is going to be the major impact here that is uh, being brought by the, uh, the act? Oh, gosh. Um, right. The government wants quality SARS. That's a, that's a broad term. And it's a challenge to get there. So we still have high cases of what I call defensive SAR filing or SAR filings where they've got no choice but to file, especially around correspondent banking and the identification of the third parties. That's a problematic area and I think it's addressed separately. SAR filings where you actually own the customer and you have better intelligence on who they are and who they do business with, that's a different matter. And that's where the integrity of the the of the data and the intelligence really does need to be on point because you're not just submitting the SAR itself, it's the whole record. And then when law enforcement or whoever comes back in with the correct subpoena to gain the full package of information, that information needs to be good. And so your investigative process needs to be top notch. And I think this is where I suspect we're going to see an uptick in investment because it's the skills and focus of those individuals that make the difference between a really good process and one that is still problematic as far as the regulators will be concerned. And that's where I see the data and the systems pointing towards. Yeah. And in, in from a technology point of view, and I think, you know, it's obviously the banks need to make sure that they do have, you know, all the data that you need to include on the on the SARS, right? So again, going back to have a better data governance, right? Yes. Have uh, you know good quality of data? Make sure that data lineage is well mapped across you know their financial services data model that they use for the financial crime reporting, um, right? Yep. And that's again called out in NYDFS Rule Five Hundred Four, and now you're seeing greater understanding and articulation of 
who is your customer, the underlying data, and are your systems appropriate for your risk, volume, and ability to manage? So the data is fundamental to that. Right. Yeah. And I think uh, as we were talking to John uh, a couple of weeks ago, right, uh, I think the banks need to have the proper tools in place to collaborate with law enforcement as well. Right. For example, if John calls a bank and say, listen, let's talk about star one, two, three, four. Right. The bank should have a way that they can quickly go into their system and just query all the information they need. Uh, they, they need they have in place for the customer that is being sold, right? The for the transaction is being sold. So, John, uh, uh, what do you expect to see coming out of the banks uh, with this regulation, right? The, the, the new provision on the act. What is from your point of view? The best? You know, so so here again, you know, the, there is a a portion of this that specifically directs the government to work to work more closely. With financial, uh, with the financial institutions, right? So we're supposed to um, establish the the national AML priorities. What is it that that we are interested in? What is the hot topic? And and again, and this is important. Why it's important because we want to make sure that the resources that are being utilized by the financial industry to identify those suspicious transactions are actually being utilized to identify suspicious transactions that are of interest to law enforcement, right? Because we cannot, it, it's impossible in terms of being able to track down every suspicious transaction. So we're gonna have to go, you know, we have to establish these priorities. So for instance, you know, big difference between, you know, in 2019, for instance, our AML priorities were, you know, had to do with, um, you know, criminal activity, all, you know, just run of the mill. Everything was going fine, 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 fine. And then COVID hit. And then the you know the 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 the, the federal bailout program occurred, and then that program became ripe with fraud, and so what is and immediately law enforcement was like okay now we have to pivot to that, um, so it's 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 that constant communication because AML priorities can change literally from month to month depending on what is happening in the broader world. Uh, you know, a terrorist attack is immediately going to shift all law enforcement resources to that threat. And we and we're going to want the financial institutions to, you know, to join us because that's the other half of the team. If we're going to be effective, we need to, you know, to be able to switch those priorities and, and those resources. So I think, you know, getting better direction from the government or being more vocal in terms of what it is that that we are prioritizing um, is, is one of the biggest impacts that I think it's going to have on, on the filing of, of SAR specifically, because that, you know, that is going to, you know, make sure that the, in, the private industry resources are in line with, you know, with the priorities and the resources um, of the federal government to combat, you know, a specific threat. One of the things, Eduardo, I'd like to see on, you know, coming behind that is the government to actually address the thresholds. So we're all familiar with the CTR, ten thousand dollar. Ten thousand dollars, yeah. <laughs> One ten thousand dollars, even it, with the inflation it, report yesterday. It's it, it, be... <laughs> it's, people argue, oh yes, it gives us lots of information. Yeah, it does. That lots of information that nobody's really doing anything with, and it comes back to the priority. What what is the CTR for today in today's world with electronic payments and wires? on a scale that were never imagined back in the 1970s. And then but, the last point is, if if you were to consider a change in the CTR to a CYTR, a crypto-based current yeah. you know, transaction report, that might be more beneficial in, in other areas. But I, I'm, I, John, love to hear your reaction to that. So, so, so here is here here is where here's where being being a nerd is is you know finally <laughs> paying off for me. <laughs> right. Let's go back to let's go if we you know if we want to talk about the thresholds and the reason for the thresholds. Let's go back to why they were established and who they were established to identify. So the CTRs, we have to go back and you know get rid of the cool clothes we have now and go back to the eighties and the seventies. And let's remember this entire system, the the entire BSA system, our SAR reporting. All of that, 100% of it, was meant to target drug trafficking. 
a hundred percent of it. So what does that mean? That means that yes, drug dealers are no longer walking into banks with $10,000 or more. Yeah. Absolutely. However, we also have to see that the, that the SAW regime, that our, that our AML regime in the United States and around the world has expanded. So $10,000 is not a lot of money for drug dealers. But now we're talking about human trafficking, human smuggling. Mm -hmm. We're talking about credit card fraud. We're talking about elderly fraud. We're talking about all of these other um, you know, types of crime. And so, so yes, the CTR requirement, I will give you this, the CTR requirement of $10,000 for drug traffickers has been overcome by events. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But not all types of crimes covered by the money laundering statute. And I think, you know, if we're, if we're, and, and I think that's, that, that's the part that has been lost. And that's the part that never gets mentioned, right? And, you know, there are two things that are, that are, that are interesting that never get mentioned. Number one, the BSA, the Bank Secrecy Act, was never meant to be a money laundering statute. It was meant to control capital flight. It was a, it was an, a tax evasion because it was it was but at a time when in the 1970s and if you go back and you look at the congressional record and you actually read the discussion and, and if you are a nerd like me and you read the actual um, you know the fine print you'll see people they're worried about people taking cash putting it on plates taking it to Switzerland and not paying taxes on it and so it has so so from the very beginning the the bsa was not meant to do what it's doing now right it's been we've sort of been building it piece by piece and and the biggest portion of it which it comes to the you know to the reporting thresholds and everything else has always been based on cash being taken in or taken out of financial institutions right so if we really want to talk about getting rid of the thresholds then i always say this and, and i'm not popular when i say this but i said okay so Let's update it so that it also includes um, electronic transactions going in and out of financial institutions because that's what the world has become. I can tell you right now in my wallet, I have about eleven dollars in cash. I'm notorious for not carrying cash, and and so. I don't carry cash. <laughs> and, and so those, are, those are two points that that I think need to be specifically addressed when we, you know, if we're going to talk about doing anything with the threshold, because yes, the threshold needs to be moved, but not just the thresholds. I think also the focus, yeah. the focus of the focus of the reporting being um, of only being on cash in and out of, a, of an institution that I think is, 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 is dangerous because most value is comes in and out of financial institutions via electronic means and none of that is being kept track of yeah and where the potential lies with this electronic thing is you should also have what i call um interdiction triggers so as i've been building out models for ipaid on how cash would flow because you've got a near real-time capability you can interdict if you see something that is is not right triggers goes in the system shuts certain accounts down and stops moving their money uh, you can't do that in cash, but you can, and then you just wait to see how they react. You'll get a faster response. And that's something that at the moment doesn't happen, but mm -hmm. could happen very soon with the rise of all of this electronic payment and the government's push ultimately towards some form of retail based near real time come digital currency. There's a lot moving in that direction. So yeah, the game needs to change and evolve. But the thresholds, the, the, the physical amounts, because of etc., you need to change. Yeah, exactly. And uh, just to, to add on one more point, right now, you know, the crypto uh, boom, right? A lot of people carry their own digital wallets, right? It can be any different type of wallets. It can be, uh, you know, a hard wallet. It can be a cold wallet, a hot wallet. So there's multiple different types of wallets right now. And, you know, keeping track of all those things together, you know, it's, it's only when you're going to do a, the real investigation that you're going to combine all of those, right? So as Alan was mentioning, at some point, we're probably going to have to start thinking about, you know, uh, the a crypto type CTR, right? That we're going to have to, you know, uh, be filing when you, you have a specific number, a uh, dollar amount in transactions that you, you, you trade, right, in the crypto space. Well, we're already seeing the creation of a um, digital asset, crypto-based trust bank. 
Mm-hmm. And I'd love to know how that's going to impact their SAR filings and reports yeah. because they're going to be operating somewhat differently. They'll have certain common aspects to mainstream banking. They will certainly have some differences. And that's where it's quite exciting because we've got something new to do. And that makes an, it brings out all sorts of new opportunities. But inherently, there are all sorts of new risks. Yes, indeed. Okay, so Amy, let's go to our second question, second polling question. How will the AML Act 2020 affect your ongoing data governance? Do you think it's going to affect it significantly, moderately, or not at all? So let's just give you guys a minute to respond to this question. I am betting that it's going to affect moderately, but let's see what the answer is going to be. Because what are we seeing from clients that have been calling us? It's, it's not just moderately. It's their clients that are building a new data source specifically to host uh, uh, a single source of truth for financial crime specific data, which is quite an improvement that needs to be done. Right. Eduardo, it looks like we're wrapping up, so I'll end the poll and launch the results. Yes. All right. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Yeah. I could have bet my money there was around moderately. So yeah, 58% thinks it's moderately in some of you uh, significantly. So, you know, very few said not at all, but you know, great. That means you already have been working on this for a while, right? To make sure that you do have your proper uh, single source of truth for data. For data. Uh, so I think we can go now to the questions and answers, Emmy. Uh, but just before that, um, we do have a special offer for those attending the webinar today. So um, uh, Huron is going to offer you a no cost deep dive workshop for one day. It's a one day complimentary workshop for everybody that is uh, uh, joining the webinar today. So we're gonna, uh, during this day uh, workshop, we're gonna review your current state changes and uh, provide opportunities for improvement. Uh, we're gonna look into, you know, best practices and client experience that we have and uh, map around the data, the modeling and advisor strategies in governance for your bank. And we'll provide you complete details and actions needed to support all the regulatory changes and beyond that and define the business case metrics and the return of investment drivers for your institution. So for all those that are interested for this, you can contact me directly. Uh, my information is on this, uh, um, on this presentation right now, and we'll be sharing this information with you right after the webinar. So there's one last poll question before we go to questions and answers. So if you'd like to be interested and take advantage of the Huron Complimentary Workshop, just say yes or no, and then we can move on to the Q&A. All right, so let's go with the Q&A. So we have one question here open um, that is from Parsin Bunzi. Me and, me and Thorsten have worked together a long time ago. Miss those days, Thorsten, the Deutsche Bank. Uh, your question is, does the act change the regulator's view on the institution's ability to share star information with its foreign subsidiaries? Alan or John, you want to answer that? So it, there, there, is, there is. There is a change. There is going to be a, 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 a pilot program where there's the ability to share that information um, with certain with banks within certain jurisdictions. Obviously, there are certain jurisdictions that we do not want to share that information with because they're either not friendly jurisdictions or they're in the jurisdictions where we feel that the, the government feels um, that there is some kind of a danger of uh, exposing um, investigations or, or, or putting um, putting those those at risk. So yes, there, there is there is a, a a pilot project that's going to be going forward to look at that. Okay, and interestingly, there is a bit of a backdoor uh, initiative that seems to be taking place. I don't know if people have seen, but recently J.P. Morgan and others uh, they're 
discussing issuing credit cards based upon information that they get from other banks, uh, from the applicant's bank accounts elsewhere, where there is direct communication between the two banks. And that's that could inadvertently tell you a lot about a bank account somewhere else. And would you be liable to share, would you be required to share that information you get back for the credit application into your AML program if you found that the remark that came back was troublesome to be determined? But you can already see a number of initiatives around pushing the boundaries of what data can be shared between institutions and other external entities. Interesting times. Yes, indeed. All right, so let's go to the next question. Uh, does anyone have an idea on how these new rules will impact money service agents? Alan John? Um, they will, the, the, the money service agencies um, have their own particular remit and um, they have to be registered state by state. Where you, you get this challenge is, what is the federal remit on this regard? And it's, to my mind, it's still not clear. Each institution is regulated by their home state and where they have their operations. And that's the lack of coordination between the 50 states that is often a challenge. So I see things changing for them and all they really need to do is ensure the integrity of their data, their policies, procedures, and the execution of their controls. It doesn't get any easier than that, but there's often a reluctance to do it because that's cost and there's nothing like, a, like cost to deter people from spending money on what needs to be done. So it's the eternal dichotomy. Mm -hmm. And, and if I could add, and, and this, this goes throughout this, you know, the, the, this act. So once this law is passed, this becomes law. But what gives it the teeth are the federal regulations that are going to be behind the law. And that's, that's where a lot of these questions are going to be answered. And that is where the financial industry um, needs to make sure that those rules that are set out, those regulations, are actually helpful and that there aren't a lot of carve outs. So, you know, we spoke a little bit about new technologies um, and, and, and new ways of banking that, that are coming up. I can tell you, you know, one of the biggest challenges that, that, that we ended up having um, with new technology in the, in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years was with prepaid cards. When prepaid cards were first introduced, FinCEN, in order to allow them to grow, gave them a carve out. So they would, be, they would not be subject to the BSA. And they grew so quickly that all of a sudden we realized, well, of course, anything that isn't subject to the BSA is going to be where criminal activity will gravitate to. Um, and so questions like that, questions about, you know, how is this going to impact the you know, money service businesses are going to be worked out in the regulations. Um, but, you know, I, I ask and, and, and I caution the industry with creating too many exemptions and too many carve outs because then that becomes the, 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 the route by which criminals will enter the financial, um, the financial industry. And then you're just going to have to spend more resources trying to keep them out with regulations that don't exist. Right. Okay. Thank you both for John and Alan. Next question. Do you think that a FinCEN will impose the obligation for banks to check the UBO with its registry? The, um, the, go, go ahead, John. Alan. No, no, you go on. I, I think the, the, the idea is for that information to be collected and in order to expedite that onboarding process, that institutions can, um, you know, do that. In other words, it's beneficial to the, industry, to, to the institution to do it um, because it, 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 sh it tells you, look, the information has already been, you know, vetted, received this person is good and you now do not have to spend resources on trying to track all of that stuff down. The, the consultation period is still in play. It, one of the best review and consultation comments comes from Jim Richards. Those of you out there that know who Jim is, um, RegTech Compliance, he's uh, one of, um, he's an excellent colleague to work with. 
the that consultation period allows us to address the issue of if we're not allowed to access that data because it's not public um that's a very narrow definition public only means that perhaps general members of the public can't um, address what we're dealing with into sorry i've got some distractions going on public means those who are not included in the private group and i think the clarification questions that go through and are considered by the government may actually define better if and when institutions are going to be allowed to address that database. But at the moment, it doesn't seem that they can, I think partly because they haven't got the database set up yet. And mm -hmm. it doesn't really, we don't understand how it's actually going to work. There's, but it's a step forward. And I think that's the best way of putting it. Okay. So uh, we have lots of questions here. So let me, let me ask you this one here. Does the act will have any impact on the current crypto exchanges on their AML KYC policies for onboarding, given significant of number of people are investing in through banking or wallets, maybe via structuring or via smurfing? So I guess that goes based on the technology that we need to implement on the KYC uh, onboarding processes, but also uh, I think the question is more related on the policy itself, right? So, John, Alan, what do you think that this, I don't think that it specifically changes for crypto exchangers. Is this still the same policies and the law is the law for the same for, you know, even if you're a crypto exchange or a bank and... So well, what the, what the act did do is it expanded the definition of financial institution to include crypto exchangers, where before it was where they are money services business, you know, that again, just because of, of the, the rapid pace of development in the financial industry, some of these terms were not contemplated when, when, the, when the terms were defined in, you know, in the original um, BSA. So under the BSA, as a result of this act, crypto exchangers are now considered a financial institution. And so with that, they are, you know, um, responsible for the, the you know the the, whole, the entire um all of the all of the bsa requirements right uh one one last question here because we have a lot of questions and we we promise to follow up with you guys on after the webinar with all that we just don't have the time for everything so how will the act impact the koic efforts for non banks I will, can you repeat that? Yes. So how, how does the act impact the KYC efforts for non-banks? Non-banks. Yes, like for retail. And, you know. um, well, if, so if, if an institution is capturing customer data, et cetera, if they are not a bank, if they're not a financial institution, it, it doesn't cover them. Retail institution, retail banking institutions are covered by, by the Act. So we've got to remember what is of concern with regards to this abundance of new data and what the focus really is. We need to identify the individual behind activity and who controls that activity. And it's really largely to do with institutions, shell companies, and hidden beneficial owners and it's unmasking them and this is where this beneficial owner registry becomes interesting it would be great if banks can actually access it because it will improve the integrity of what they're able to do tremendously but they've still got the responsibility to identify those people who are behind the control of the institution or the entity that is conducting the transactions and that doesn't change uh, so for any bank the game is still the same okay well so i guess uh, it's two o'clock eastern uh thank you so much everybody for joining john thank you so much for your time in your morning in hawaii alan thank you again for joining us and this is my information. Should you need to do some follow-up questions and answers, uh, please do feel free to reach out to me.
And uh, we'll provide an answer to some of the questions that we were not able to answer online. I'll provide them uh, um, post webinar when we send the deck uh, to everybody. Again, thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and we appreciate your, your joining us this afternoon to have this uh, fire chat with us.